been working on seven different projects, and uh, I think I've applied to we've applied to 15 different uh, contracts, RFPs, and grants this year. So it's extremely, extremely busy. So the whole self-funded position, I'm not afraid of it. I'm more afraid of how am I going to get that work done. Uh, <laughs> and I also see um, this um, kind of as a stepping stone in the way that any experience that we can get is a stepping stone to something else. And even if I'm not at the PhD level at the moment, um, I do anything from the grant writing to the data analysis to the manuscript write-up to presenting to the clients and that kind of stuff. So I get to play with a lot of things. Um, I get to take classes because I'm at the university and continue to build my skill set. And I've decided that what was the most important was maybe knowing the tools and knowing tools that maybe not as many people know how to use but find interesting. So I do uh, GIS uh, for geographic analysis, in-plan economic impact studies. And um, those are actually pretty demanded um, by clients. So that allows me to keep uh, working on. Um, not sure what I will do in the future. Um, I mean, I'm really happy here, and like you said, Sean, the quality of life with Stephanie has been a huge piece, and a partner too, not wanting to move away, I was very happy here. <laughs> so those have all been factors, but I definitely have an eye toward the future, but keeping on building my CV, you know, what are things that I can do, um, understand how academia works, if it's, that's what I want to do, but kind of um, have an open ear into um, anything that's happening. Uh, last piece on the panel is the post post doc position. <laughs> <laughs> or the new post doc, I call it. I like to call it the new post doc. So, uh, before I started the post doc, a post doctoral fellowship, uh, I heard rumors that post docs were a time of quiet contemplation, <laughs> basking in the glow of your successful grad student career. Maybe writing a few publications, you know, getting the pieces of the dissertation out there that you hadn't before and starting a small research project that you would, you know, show, demonstrate to people that you could do that kind of thing. And in reality, you need to do that. But you also need to supervise students and write research funding applications and land research funding and teach and write research funding applications and lead a research project and write a book and write more research funding applications and demonstrate conclusively that you made a personal and significant contribution to ending global conflict, inequality, or world food insecurity. <laughs> and apply for jobs. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. And that list leaves off a whole bunch of things that are fairly important in a successful postdoc experience. You may not have got to some of these as a PhD. Really, that's, that's part of what you're doing as a postdoc. Like things like personal hygiene, getting a life, <laughs> <laughs> expanding your horizons, networking, developing a set of collaborators you can write with, explore new research with, and turn to for support, including writing research funding applications. <laughs> so what's the postdoc for? The short answer is that's up to you. Right? It's, it's about creating opportunities, so what type of opportunities are you looking for? And really this builds off of a lot of what the other folks on the panel have been saying, right? So where are you going? Why do you want to be there? How do you position yourself to get there, right? So if it's a career in academia, you can gain experience in teaching and research as a postdoc and in writing research funding applications. All of these things are essential in an academic career, right? So look for a mentor with a history of, of success, particularly in writing research funding applications because you have to get paid as well. <laughs> and who is well connected with leading researchers in your field. This gives you flexibility, it gives you connections. Your mentor will be the one who can introduce you to the people that are closest to them. If they are the leading people in your field, then your opportunities suddenly expand, right? If teaching's your thing, then you can use postdoc to develop your training, design courses, build your teaching dossier. It's like being in all of these positions at once, really. You know, you get to do a bit of each, and unfortunately you have to do all of them at the same time. But these, these skills and connections apply not only in academia, right? They're valuable if you want to look outside of the academy. And if you want to do that, then look for a mentor who has connections to the kinds of networks that interest you, right? 
to nonprofit, you know, or community organizations, find somebody who does a lot of community-based research, right? Throw yourself into that work, put your hand up and say, sure, I want to do that research, you know, why not? As you can probably tell to me, the most important piece of the experience as a grad student, which carries through into a postdoc position, is finding the right mentor. So it's not just finding somebody who has funding, but finding somebody that you can work with and that you want to work with and has the same objectives for you that you have for yourself, right? So it's making it clear with them where do you both see you in a couple of years, in three years, and that's, you know, making sure that you both have in your minds, this is how you can get there. These are the things you need to do. This is how I, as a mentor, can help you get there. Whether it's making connections, do you want to be connected to community-based work? Do you want to be connected to Terry Myerson? You know, if your mentor can do these things for you, then this is a good place to be. And mainly it's about developing a diverse network of contacts. Because no matter where your interests are, it's these contacts that are, that are going to be the gateway to your new opportunities, right? And one of the most important things you can do for yourself is to keep all of your options open. Because you never know where the opportunities are going to come from. So admittedly, this wasn't a hard thing for me to do. I've turned keeping options open into a life project. <laughs> but it helped that one of my first postdoc roles was acting as coordinator of a large interdisciplinary social science research group called Nourishing Communities. They're running a workshop here on Friday afternoon. Please join them. They're a very interesting group of people. Um, from this, I developed global connections with top-level researchers, supplementing some of the connections that I'd already developed from active participations in groups like this. This is another great place to develop connections, make partnerships, look for co-authors, all of these things that you will need to do. This is a great place to do it, especially this conference. It's small, it's intimate, you can talk to people, you can get a really deep sense of what it is they're doing and why they're doing it and whether or not you can drink beer with them. That kind <laughs> of all of these are very important things. It's never too early to get involved in a group like Ag Food and Human Values. I'm co-chair of the Membership and Communications Committee, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Find other ways of contributing, develop other skill sets, get active in peer review, if that kind of thing works for you, right? Ask with editors of journals that you read a lot, do you need peer reviewers? They do, they really do. Take a more active role if, if you want than that. I mean, if, if uh, journals are the kind of thing that interests you, this is another potential career. Become a, an associate editor of a journal. These kind of positions are there. They all need them, especially now that they're developing more and more online journals that you know don't have professional staff. These kind of positions are out there. I guess I should tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now, or some of the things I'm doing now. How much time do I have, Sean? Should I wrap it up? Seven minutes. I'm at seven minutes? But we both went a good bit over it, so. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's okay. I, I want to get out of here anyway. Okay. <laughs> England is playing in the World Cup. <laughs> right now. Sorry. Priorities. I digress. Um, I think uh, the only thing I'm going to say then. I'm doing a whole bunch of things uh, as a postdoc, including research, um, leading a research project on uh, getting food into public institutions by growing food on institutional land. Ask me about that if you want to find out more about that, or look up projectsoil.ca. Um, but one of the last things I want to touch on was get active in your community as well, many people have mentioned, but Sean make a point of mentioning you have another dimension to your person or several other dimensions to your person. Make sure you don't let them wither and atrophy. Mm -hmm. um, if you've just finished a PhD, you need to reconnect with the rest of your human <laughs> beingness. 
Um, there's food round tables. There's all kinds of ways to get active in your community around the things that you are, love and are passionate about. Um, all kinds of community work that you can do. They are always looking for people. And I guess I'll leave it there. So we have about 25 minutes for Q&A. And uh, people have questions, comments, whatever. The floor is open. Yeah, and thank you for this conference. I have a job, and I have students that are always asking about these things, and so I've picked up quite a few good tips. I just wanted to add, a, just real quick, to the academic, because uh, I mean, your points are all valid, but as someone who's chaired numerous search committees, mm -hmm. one of the things is th that letter that you write had better hit every point in the job description, because that's how yeah. we score it. And if you yeah. skip one, your score just drops. Mm -hmm. That's OEO stuff. I mean, we have to score it that way. Um, and if you do get a job offer or a job interview, mm -hmm. prepare for it. Do go yeah. beyond. Like, so who are you going to collaborate with? Who else do you want to talk to? You know, because we'll set up a nice little interview for you. But you can demonstrate you're really interested by saying, "Well, there's someone in this other department that I want to see." Right? And where are you going to get your funding? At least have thought through. Because in academics, it's, you know, you got to get funding. And so, have you thought about that? <laughs> Besides, well, I'm going to use my startup package, which we just had an interview <laughs> with someone. Oh, I'm going to use my startup package. OK. <laughs> You're not going to get one of those, but that's all right. Um, so anyway, your points are very, were very, very valid. Um, and, um, and it's a challenge for many of you. I'm in nutrition, but because you're, you're cross-discipline, but in academia, it's silos. Mm -hmm. And so you don't quite fit a lot of times when you have this cross-discipline type of um, background. So you really got to make the case that you fit that job. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, one is uh, for Chelsea. I, I was interested in hearing more about um, what you do on a daily basis. And you mentioned two other positions being open, just if you can also sure. generally. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about that. Um, and then also, um, for a few of you could answer this question, just uh, if you can give us more guidance on how to prepare for non-academic jobs. I'm interested in the research and the government um, positions. Um, and, and like you mentioned, grad school doesn't prepare as well. So if you can kind of say more about how, what we can do. So I'll just, just have a little bit about my day-to-day. -day. Um, I would say about 50% of my time is probably spent in meetings. Um, we really, you know, I, I think especially in the development division, we really see one of our primary roles is facilitating conversation, uh, conversations and making connections between partners. So that means a lot of sitting down together, um, which in, you know, working in food and agriculture is always pretty fun. <laughs> Lots of good shared meals and um, sometimes a shared beer too. So, um, of course, not during work hours. Um, <laughs> um, I, as I said, um, have a lot of different, especially, in, again, in our development division, um, there's always so many different projects going on. So the, you know, uh, over the course of the day, I could be visiting a solar facility, um, consulting with a business that's looking to export um, to the Caribbean, and then at the end of the day, maybe writing a grant for an agritourism initiative. So um, definitely a high tolerance for multitasking um, in, I, I would say, probably most government work. Maybe some of the regulators are um, have a little bit of a more focused path, but um, especially during the legislative session, anything could come up at any time and being able to kind of prioritize and be nimble um, will lead to success. Um, the positions that we're hiring, we're hiring someone to um, do farm to school programs. So it might be people at this conference who are interested in um, directing farm to school programs in Vermont. Um, we pride ourselves as really um, seeing ourselves as a leader in, in farm to school in the country. So. Um, it's a kind of exciting opportunity to be in the middle of that. Um, and then the second position we're hiring is um, to do what we're calling domestic export, so helping companies connect to markets outside of Vermont but within the U.S. Um, involves a lot of kind of promotion and organizing activities to connect companies with buyers in New York and Boston, primarily.
entirely. Um, I would say kind of tips for getting government jobs. Um, a lot of times government agencies don't kind of post in the normal places that you find jobs, um, just because a lot of those times those posting costs money and we don't put money, we basically post on our HR website and assume that that means that everyone knows <laughs> the jobs are open. Um, and good luck finding the HR website. So um, <laughs> I would say, you know, it, don't assume that because you don't see a job on, you know, wherever place you're looking for these jobs doesn't mean that there's not an opening um, in a government agency. Um, also, you know, similar to what you're saying about the cover letter, if you see that things are required in um, the posting, make sure that you include them because I've had candidates totally screened out and if they're screened out by HR, we don't even see the applicant and they can't, you can't go back and get yourself back in. So make sure you pay attention to all the details in that hiring process. Um, we, are, we, are, we don't have the flexibility in, um, in our bureaucracy to be able to um, <laughs> be flexible. So um, the other thing is that I think, and again, maybe not all positions in state government, de but definitely probably the type that you all would be looking for, um, there tends to be some opportunity to create your own position. Um, I came, my master's thesis was around infrastructure, um, agricultural infrastructure, specifically meat processing infrastructure. Um, and I, this was like this one little piece of expertise that I brought to a position in a new state that I didn't know with people I didn't know. Um, and I was really kind of able to build a program around my interest and expertise in the meat industry. Um, so being able to have the kind of the flexibility to do that. And there's always more, I would say this is definitely true across government, um, there's always more work to do than there are people to do it. So sometimes that can be a good thing because you can kind of pick and choose and have some opportunity to, to dive into what you see as the highest priority. Um, so preparing, um, I was just giving my friend this advice over lunch. I think one of the key things that my mentor did a great job with me um, in practicing is a one to two minute elevator speech. Really <coughs> nail your identity and what you want to do. And it's the reason isn't necessarily when you meet people, it's that every single person in your department knows who you are and knows what you want to do because I found out about this position through word of mouth. So a person that I have really never interacted with had heard my elevator speech and she said, you work in food security and food systems. I just heard about this position opening up and that's how I was able to connect there. Otherwise, um, uh, I ended up applying with a, a cover letter Although there's a lot more flexibility because I'm in a small center, so they don't have that online kind of check everything. So there is some flexibility there with requirements and preferences. Um, CV really needed to be up to date. Um, go to as many conferences as you're getting funding to go to, because I think building your network is really important because there, there might be an association that you meet your first year of the doctoral program that will come around and really help vet you later on. Um, let folks know again on the letters of support, have them on the radar. But something interesting that it was fine, but was really surprising is that my executive director didn't call people on my references. She knew some other people in the department and she just gave them a call. And so I guess, um, you know, and it, it was fine and great and, you know, thanks guys. Um, but, <laughs> but, I, that was unexpected as an applicant. I was like, no, these are my five people. Like, only call them. But really, I mean, um, things, networks are really interesting, and I think never burn bridges, period. Um, so, the, the nonprofit preparation is very similar to the academic preparation, but there is some more flexibility in one direction. Um, and negotiate like heck. Mm -hmm. I was really fortunate. I um, had two jobs offers simultaneously and I didn't give them very much information about each other and I know that doesn't always happen but I was able to kind of hint like oh hmm that salary hmm and that ended up really helping um, change the dynamic so so that was that's something if you can so I know it's a, it's a not good situation <laughs> but, yeah but in so maybe not yeah but that's that's a great situation to be in too and 
it can go fast, like at the end of my interview, because it's such a small center, she called the board and she offered me the job um, that day. And so that's another thing to be prepared for. Like, do you really want to be there? Or are you just kind of testing the waters? has a master's except for our one of our interns. So um, lots of MPH, but we also have MAs, which I think is really great if you're interdisciplinary. I mean, you can come in from a completely different angle, but if you're passionate about like this, this type of work, I think you can make a nice case. Um, in the state government, you tend to be able to substitute experience for education. Um, so there's a pretty good mix of people across educational backgrounds, which I actually really appreciate. Um, in our division, I would say it's probably, I don't know, no PhDs, um, although in the regulatory sections there are um, several PhDs. Um, I would say probably about, a, maybe half of us have a master's degree and the rest have um, bachelor's. Um, I'm wondering how much um, weight employers put on what you did for your thesis versus the content of your coursework. Um, for instance, my thesis is focused on farmers and producers, and I'm looking for jobs that are working more on like food access and the consumer end. So I'm just wondering if you have any, any experience or to some degree, that's how you spin the cover letter too. Okay. Yeah, and I think I mean that. That holds true for academia, and I would assume for non-academic positions too. But to some degree, it's kind of how you put that cover letter together to pitch yourself. Um, and, and I mean, speaking for academic positions, there were a couple of positions I applied to where I said hmm, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I think I can make a go for it. And I really recrafted that letter to aim for what that job was looking for. And even though I was kind of like, let's downplay this, but upplay this other piece here. Okay. So, I think what's as equally important is the tools that you've been able to learn. So, um, and that's something that I did really early on in my master's is I decided that you can read as much as you want on your own about the literature. You know, you could, you know, other than the requirements, I could have taken classes that were more topic oriented. What I decided to do was more um, hard skills. So, you know, like GIS, um, implant, um, you know, qualitative methods, so that perhaps you did your thesis on something that's not related, but you have the tools that you can, you know, we can all read, and you know, the master and PhD level, we can all pick up a book, articles, read them, and, and become experts in some ways. The only thing I'd add to that would be, if you're looking at food access positions, I would think that there would be more emphasis on what you've done, like what kind of experiences you've had, have you worked in the community in that kind of sort of area before, even as a volunteer for that kind of thing? Yeah, I would encourage you in the letter, and in the, um, if you give a presentation, I was often having to give a presentation, that you're very specific about how you're going to approach that topic so that you can show not only the breadth of your knowledge, but the depth of the knowledge. So give concrete examples. Well, also, reference letters are good there, too. Um, but, and if you have anything you want your reference letter writers to say, tell them. Because if you've, and if you've never written a reference letter, sometimes they're hard. <laughs> you know, I've had to write some for undergrads, and that alone, I'm like, what do I say about them? They're really awesome. I like them. Um, you know, you got to say more than so. If you have anything that you're like, hey, you really know my work here, can you talk about that? Ha asking them to do that. For, for non-academic jobs, non-profit 
Um, I, I didn't have nonprofit experience before I started, so I, at least from my experience, I would say no. But I think building your toolbox is key. So, um, you know, embrace the statistics. Like, I'm, when there's a, a SAS conference, I'm all over it because these are things that I think are just. It's, it's like all the letters behind my name. These are tangible. It's like she's trained in SPSS, she's trained in SAS, she's trained in InVivo. If I had an opportunity where I need to do some secondary data analysis, I can immediately give it to her and she has the skill set to do it. Um, at least in my, my area in nutrition, I think those are, are really concrete, important skills. Um, and it, it gives you the edge. Um, you are, so if you're in a, in a situation where, for example, that I'm in that I don't have a contract, I want to make it impossible for my center to release me because I'm so valuable. And you can gain not only through what you're doing, but having those tangible skills that they would miss if I wasn't there. So build those up as much as you can. It will pay out. Um, I would say having um, being able to talk about some work experience outside of the classroom is really valuable and the hiring committees that I've been on, especially for people coming right out of grad school, being able to say you have you know, some sort of practical experience that involves bringing multiple stakeholders together um, in, at least in the type of position I hold, I would say kind of the, the public speaking, facilitating, being able to play well with others, um, those things that you don't necessarily get in the classroom um, are, are kind of critical when we are interviewing someone. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, in, in, in the state government and federal, federal government, you kind of have to let go of your own individual perspective sometimes, you know, I, and actually that is something I think that I learned in grad school. To, look at kind of the full range of perspectives on an issue and realize that there's not necessarily kind of black and white, but there's a lot of gray. Um, you know, in Vermont, 85% of our agricultural income comes from conventional dairy. Um, so, you know, saying that you only want to work with organic, sustainable veggie farmers, um, or, you know, <laughs> thinking that that is the kind of future of agriculture, it's just, you know, you, you really have to empathize with all different types of agriculture and all different types of business um, and look at them as kind of part of the system. So when people come in and they're kind of really focused on this, you know, one little piece of the agricultural or food system, um, that can kind of be a challenging mindset to bring into um, a big government agency. Anything else? Yeah. All right, well, if you have other questions, you want to come chat with us, uh, I'm sure we'll be around for a few minutes. If anybody wants business cards, I know some of us have them, you can email us later with questions. Um, and if not, I hope to see many of you later tonight. Uh, and at the meeting. And at the meeting as well. And yes. even though it's called a business meeting, it's very interactive and inclusive, and you don't need to be part of the business meeting club to come and be part of that meeting. And where, where is it? Uh, it's in... It's in Jefferson's 112. Which is on the other side of the campus from here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Awesome.